The aims of nuclear policy towards Iran at the most basic level are first that Iran should not have nuclear weapons capability or failing that should not deploy nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that the non-proliferation treaty regime should be both preserved and strengthened. The international community have done much but have been unsuccessful over the last 10 years against that first benchmark that Iran should not have a nuclear weapons capability. Iran is now approaching that capability. And the risk to the non-proliferation regime remains serious. There are four policies which have been adopted at different times in different combinations by states collectively or acting on their own. First of all, the all-important collective action under Iran's safeguards agreement with the IAEA. Secondly, dialogue. First, the European Union with its constructive engagement before 2003. Then an initiative designed by Britain, France and Germany known as the E3. Later, that group expanded to include Russia, China, and the United States, the permanent five members of the Security Council, plus one, the one being Germany. Then, of course, tentative US approaches to Iran, an initiative by Brazil and Turkey in 2010, Russian proposals in 2006, and again in 2011. So, plenty of effort. Thirdly, coercion and coercive diplomacy through UN Security Council decisions, including on sanctions, through US, EU, and other countries' sanctions imposed by law, by national law, and US action behind the scenes, some would call it bullying, of companies that fall outside formal US jurisdiction to cease their dealings with Iran. And finally, aggressive actions, their actions short of war, and threats of major future warlike aggression, meaning actions by a state or states that have included assassinations <coughs> and sabotage, and threats of attack to preempt acquisition of nuclear weapons or weapons capability by the United States and Israel. Our intention this afternoon is to give you an account of two strategies. Each will, I believe, draw on elements from that list of policies. But I also believe the speakers will make a case that their proposals are designed to do more and to do better. So to begin with, John Davis, most grateful to him for taking time out of his work as additional director, Middle East and North Africa, at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Uh, appointed to that position in September 2011. Prior to that, he was head of several divisions within the overall Middle East and North Africa section of the Foreign Office, including the head of the Iran Department at the FCO, and before that, he was deputy head of mission at the British Embassy in Cairo. John. Use the podium or I think I will. Yeah, whichever you wish. Thank you, thank you Richard. Uh, and thank you also to Chatham House for giving this opportunity. Richard, you describe it as taking time out from the job of being uh, additional director. It, it isn't to state what's well, perhaps the obvious. This is uh, this issue, but also this sort of event, this sort of opportunity that I would see as very much part of, a key part of the work of of anyone uh, in the uh, running the Middle East uh, sections, which we keep calling different things, but uh, you know what we're trying to do underneath. And part of what we're trying to do is, as you say, do more and to do, to do better. As uh, some of us were discussing just before uh, William Hague's uh, recent speech. And it is that level of aspiration to try uh, to do more and to do better. And we try to do it on Iran too, but it is a challenge. Uh, I will try to rise to the particular challenge you've given us today, Richard, uh, and explain both a little bit about what we are doing now, but also the strategy which we are trying to make work. 
Can I would just say before I come on to the detail of, of our position, of the UK position, um, the only point perhaps I would take some issue with on Richard's introduction is, is, is the sense that the, uh, those approaches which you describe are, uh, are separate in some way. I think you did it, suggest that, we, that various of us with different strategies will pick from, all, pick from all of those elements. And I think that's right. I think to think that a, uh, a, uh, a monolithic or, or a single track approach to the challenge of Iran and the challenge of Iran with a, a nuclear weapons capability simply won't work. So I think we have to be looking at something which is a complex of different approaches. I'll also expand briefly, if I may, on, on the aims. I think you, uh, as ever, Richard, crystallized it very well in terms of what we are trying to do. Uh, but if I may just briefly expand on that as to why it is such a priority for this government to, to do what you described, to try to prevent Iran from uh, achieving that nuclear weapons capability which we believe is its, its aim. It is particularly acute, that pressure on us to rise to the challenge because of uh, the nature of the current government of Iran. Uh, it's not necessarily tied to uh, what Iran could be or should be or maybe will be, but uh, the way that Iran uh, is being run and has been run for 30 years or more now, I think justifiably strengthens uh, the case for, uh, for acting, uh, both in the way we have so far, but also in, in maintaining that level of energy, uh, that level of, uh, of imagination in how we face down the threat. Because... Uh, I think there is no doubt from the way that Iran continues to behave both internally but also uh, its behaviour in its own region uh, that reinforces uh, the case uh, for us to take this very seriously. I'm not, as you Richard and you Peter know, a, uh, a non-proliferation expert. If I'm a, I wouldn't claim to be an expert on anything, but if I spent my time doing anything over the last 20 years, it's mostly working on the Middle East. So I will um, bow to the expertise of Peter especially. But uh, I think it is also clear that over and above anything Iran specific here, we are talking about preserving and strengthening the institutions uh, of the non-proliferation architecture internationally, uh, particularly the treaty. Uh, it is also about avoiding what we think is the likely, if not inevitable, consequence of Iran achieving uh, nuclear weapons capability is the spread of that uh, capability to the rest of, not the rest of the Middle East in the sense of all of the Middle East, but I think it is broadly accepted uh, that countries, uh, including Saudi Arabia, were, would be likely to go down the same path uh, that Iran, as Iran gets nearer and nearer to that nuclear weapons capability. Uh, and I think uh, our, our analysis is certainly that that would inevitably be a bad thing for our interests, but also the interests of the countries in the region. And finally, on why this is so important, uh, the fact that the international community has invested such effort in this. There are disagreements. I won't be foolish to stand up here today and claim there was uh, uh, unanimity <coughs> on, on both the extent of the threat and how to deal with it. Uh, but the fact that there is uh, this series of Security Council resolutions, there, are this, uh, there, are, there is the same uh, series of uh, decisions and resolutions of the IAEA board uh, show that the level of international concern is great. There are differences to the methods, but we shouldn't shy away from the fact that I think all the key players on this share that first aim we, you mentioned, Richard, which was to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon or the capability for one. What has under, underpinned the British approach to this uh, for many years is uh, is a wish to find a peaceful and diplomatic solution. That sounds trite, but it's true, uh, because our analysis of the alternatives to uh, a peaceful and diplomatic solution are, I think, the same as most of, uh, I would imagine, this audience's would be, that is likely to take us down a path uh, of a violent path which would, again, not serve our interests or those of the countries in the region. Those who've worked on this agenda inside government and out, whichever government that is, uh, we'll know how important legality, both international law and our own law, is. Uh, and uh, I think it is worth me restating here that that, the legality of our approach, uh, is a key fact uh, in anything and everything we do uh, in terms of trying to achieve this policy aim. 
The pressure, the sanctions that have resulted or have been part of that uh, approach over the last uh, years have had two main aims. Uh, and again, I apologize if this is going over old ground, but it is partly because, as I should have said at the beginning, and as I, Richard might have, I've warned Richard, uh, what I will be saying today, do not expect any bold policy announcements. He wouldn't have been. Uh, but, it, but therefore, it's, it's worth me reminding people that a lot of the sanctions are directly targeted against the nuclear program. Uh, it is designed to, uh, s to slow down and stop the, the direct processes, the direct elements of that program. Uh, it is right that that is the case, that it, there is that very clear direct link to uh, the procurement for and the uh, promotion of uh, uh, what we believe to be an illicit nuclear weapons program. But as the years have gone by, as Richard uh, suggests, the, as being frank, that has not achieved the effects we wanted. Uh, inevitably, that sanctions pressure has broadened and more elements of it now are designed to change behavior of the leadership of Iran as opposed to uh, specifically and directly targeting the program itself. And again, I would argue that that is legitimate given the length of time Iran has uh, chosen not to uh, comply with the demands that are being put on it through the Security Council resolutions and through the agency. There is a sense sometimes that that, Iran's, that, that Iran is being demonized, that its behavior with respect to its nuclear program uh, and with respect to safeguards obligations and respect to the agency is overdone. Uh, William Hague, Foreign Secretary, uh, wrote an article earlier this summer, which some of you, I hope, may have seen, uh, which set out uh, what was, I hope, both technically credible but also uh, plausible and convincing to a lay audience why we believe, and this is absolutely critical to our current approach, why we believe that there is there is no plausible uh, justification, no plausible argument that Iran can produce that its nuclear activity is aimed purely at a civil, uh, uh, a civil nuclear program. Uh, there are people much more expert on this who uh, may well choose to take issue with that, but uh, from our expertise, from our internal experts from across the UK government, but also uh, the governments we work with, it simply does not make sense for Iran to be uh, carrying out the nuclear activities it is doing if all its intent is, is a civil nuclear program. Uh, that is particularly true of the develops, developments at the Fordow plant. It is true of the enrichment to 20%. One could come up with partial answers to why both of those things might be part of a coherent uh, Iranian program for civil nuclear power, but they don't have such a, such a coherent picture. Uh, and I don't think any of us should be taken in by that. That is not, that is a UK view, but I think the other critical piece of information, the other critical document uh, for those who don't believe the seriousness of the challenge is the, uh, the annex to the uh, Director General of the agency's report, I think from April. Uh, I think it's the April report, which set out very clearly both some of the, uh, sorry, February, I beg your pardon, uh, which set out some of the areas where Iran had uh, declared activities, but also in one very simple page set out what, what Armando described as the areas where Iran is not meeting its obligations. And it's a long list. I won't, um, uh, there's a need for me to run through them, I think, on this occasion, but they are, they run through every single part of Iran's nuclear activity, and I think reinforce the case as to why this challenge is so great and why we cannot uh, um, uh, ignore the fact that this current Iranian government <coughs> has a set of nuclear activities which appear to us to have only one explanation, which is the pursuit of a nuclear uh, weapons capability. Richard used the phrase more and more, to do more and to do better. We are uh, in government and including in discussions with experts such as Richard and Peter and others constantly trying to find different ways of achieving this diplomatic and peaceful solution. Uh, we do that here in London, we do that with, with, uh, with in other capitals too. I think those who are most familiar, and you can talk to people in other governments too, uh, with the most recent face-to-face -face talks with the Iranians, whether it's in Geneva or Istanbul, uh, will, I think, would, uh, would accept that the three plus three countries which does reflect a broad range of opinion in the tactical approach to Iran, went into those meetings 
uh, open to an equal amount of imagination from the Iranian side. Uh, and I think it's also equally clear that we got none. Uh, to be honest, in, in Geneva, that was not an enormous surprise. In Istanbul, it was more of a surprise. I think uh, the six countries uh, and Cathy Ashton felt that with the level of imagination and flexibility uh, that we were showing, with the willingness to take um, some kind of step-by-step -step approach to get this moving, uh, the willingness to re-examine the details of something like the deal that uh, Richard referred to uh, as a Turkish-Brazilian initiative um, uh, on the Tehran Research Reactor. All of that kind of thing, all of those issues, all of those ways forward, all those ways to start this moving were on the table. And they were very, very clearly rebuffed by uh, the Iranian delegation. Now, we know that the format of those meetings is not always uh, easiest for any of us, uh, but particularly for an Iranian system which uh, internally uh, may be having its own debates as to what the right approach is. But uh, there is flexibility and a, and a willingness to uh, look at different ways of getting this negotiated process working. There is flexibility as to which of the uh, many demands placed on Iran by, its, by the resolutions and by the IEA uh, are critical in the short term. Uh, it is not the case that Iran is being asked to do absolutely everything up front and getting nothing for it. Uh, that has been made clear directly to the Iranians in those meetings. Uh, we have our own diplomatic contacts with the Iranians. We, we get the point across and uh, certainly all but one of the six countries of the E3 plus three uh, do likewise. Uh, there has been perhaps the most recent example of that, and it's, it's really for the, for the Russian government to, to explain in detail its initiative, but you'll be aware, I think, uh, of comments made after the visit of uh, Iranian Foreign Minister Salahi to Moscow recently, and then the subsequent visit by various senior Russian officials to Tehran. Again, where that was a, uh, a Russian attempt, bilateral attempt, but uh, certainly with a knowledge of the E3 plus 3, obviously, to, again, to try to see whether there was some flexibility in the Iranian system uh, about getting this process of discussion going. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, Russian colleagues found the response in Tehran, again, disappointing. Uh, the E3 plus 3 met again, as some of you will be aware, at political director level in New York last week. And we will continue to do so to see whether we can come up within these uh, within the broad framework of our current approach with things which can help the Iranians move. Because we know that if we are going to get a shift from the Iranian system, uh, that will not be easy for those who want to make the shift. Uh, we will show the imagination. We will try to give the openings. Uh, equally, we will not, uh, I think, shift the fundamental approach, which is a complex one, as I said at the beginning. It's one which is, is open to engagement, but is also uh, convinced that Iran is not going to change its behavior without a level of pressure. The current level of pressure is growing, both in the sense of new measures being applied, but also uh, the cumulative effect of the measures on the economy. Uh, I think the key judgment which we all have to make is whether that mixture of engagement and pressure is going to work in time. Uh, that is not a foregone conclusion. Uh, we accept that, which is why we need to keep being imaginative on both tracks both on the pressure track, but also on the engagement track. Uh, I'm conscious, I think I'm uh, overstaying my welcome at the podium. Uh, I will, um, sure there will be um, a feisty question and answer session at the end. So I will uh, give way to Peter. <coughs> Thank you very much, John. Uh, Peter Jenkins joined the diplomatic service in 1973. His career took him to Vienna twice, a variety of other overseas posts. In 2001, he was made ambassador to the International Atomic Energy Agency and other UN organizations at Vienna. There, his primary focus was on the nuclear aspects of international peace and security, especially the Iranian <coughs> nuclear issue. More recently, Peter has joined forces with former colleagues to form ADRG Ambassadors, a dispute settlement and a corporate diplomacy problem-solving partnership. Peter. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, I'm going to um, start by explaining why the 
present policy, the policy that, that John has just um, set out and, if I may say so, defended so ably, um, why there are aspects of it that worry me. Uh, and then in the second part of my um, presentation, I will try and be um, more positive and more constructive. Um, I don't want what I'm going to say to be taken in a spirit of, of criticism, because I think that would be in very bad taste, given my own diplomatic service background, uh, and because I realize that UK policymakers have very good reasons uh, for not uh, diverging on this issue uh, from US policymakers, and that US policymakers uh, have to have a policy uh, that will um, placate Congress uh, which is full of American politicians um, who have the deepest of distrust of Iran uh, and who would rather see the American president uh, negotiate with the devil than engage in engagement uh, with Iran. So what are the things that, that, that worry me? Well, first, I, I, I contend that there's a whiff of illegitimacy about um, our present policy. Um, the fact is, and it's an awkward fact, an unwelcome fact, but it's a fact, um, that neither the NPT nor the IAE statute uh, require a state that has been in non-compliance with its safeguards obligations, as of course Iran was during 18 years, uh, require such a state to suspend or, in, or abandon any of the nuclear activities that are allowed under the treaty. Uh, nor do they justify trying to coerce a state uh, to abandon such activities. Um, and secondly, the uh, Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, uh, which has, of course, been used to bring in a number of, uh, quote, international obligations, unquote, uh, that Iran is, is not meeting. Um, chapter 7 does, of course, authorize the, the uh, Security Council to impose sanctions on a state like Iran. Uh, but it seems to require a prior determination um, that the activities that are being sanctioned uh, represent a threat to the peace. Um, at no stage has the Security Council, and it's introduced, five, I think it's five resolutions now against Iran, but none of those resolutions contains a clear-cut determination uh, that Iran's nuclear activities represent a threat to the peace. Uh, in my view, that's not entirely surprising. Uh, second uh, preliminary point, um, oh, I've forgotten a preliminary point that I wanted to make, if you'll forgive me interrupting myself, but it's quite an important one. Everything I'm going to say is um, predicated on the assumption that Iran is not yet a nuclear arms state uh, and that its leaders have not yet uh, taken a decision. Uh, on whether or not to produce nuclear weapons. Uh, in December 2010, President Putin said, we do not have grounds to suspect that Iran has aspirations to possess nuclear weapons. And in February 2011, um, US Director of National Intelligence Clapper said, testifying before Congress, we continue to assess Iran is keeping open the option to develop nuclear weapons in part by developing various nuclear capabilities that better position it to produce such weapons should it choose to do so. We do not know, however, if Iran will eventually decide to build nuclear weapons. Iran's nuclear decision-making is guided by a cost-benefit approach which offers the international community opportunities to influence Tehran. So that was, a, that was, as it were, one of the preliminary points I wanted to make. Now, to return to the things that are, uh, are troubling me, um, secondly, I'm not sure that the present policy is very well judged if one considers um, Iranian mentalities, if you like, Iran's self, a sense of national identity. Um, Iranians are a, a proud people who are conscious that they're heirs to one of the oldest and greatest of Asian uh, civilizations. Uh, they fell on hard times in the 18th century, but they still have a, a strong sense of their own worth. Um, they react best to, to foreigners who treat them with uh, respect and civility. Uh, they look for reciprocity in their dealings with other nations. Um, 
they are not the sort of people who are likely to buckle under pressure. Uh, on the contrary, all the evidence is that pressure brings out a, a streak of defiance in their, nation, in their nature and a certain obstinacy. Third, I think the present policy is risky um, because it encourages the general public in the West uh, to believe that Iran's nuclear activities uh, present a clear and present danger uh, that needs to be limited uh, eliminated by, by fair means or foul. Um, I, I'm fairly confident that the current incumbent of the White House uh, won't uh, yield to pressures uh, to take a military action uh, against Iran, uh, but who knows uh, who will replace him sooner or later in the White House and, and, and whether that uh, replacement will be as wise. And I think you all know, you don't need me to spell out, how devastating for the West would be a confrontation with Iran, a military confrontation over its nuclear program. Uh, fourthly, it's a costly, the current uh, approach is costly. Um, it's uh, inhibited the development of Iran's oil and gas reserves. Iran is currently producing 60% of the oil it produced in the last years of the Shah. Uh, yet over the last decade, uh, demand for oil in Asia has surged, taking with it uh, global demand. And now global supply is scarcely keeping pace with uh, global demand. Uh, the result we've all seen at the petrol pumps. Uh, the West actually needs um, more Iranian oil, not yet, not less. Um, it's also, the policy is also costing uh, Western exporters orders which have gone to Asian competitors. And now the alleged Iranian nuclear threat is being used to justify the construction of an expensive uh, ballistic missile defensive screen in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and finally, the, the policy is counterproductive in that it's led Iran uh, to restrict uh, IAEA inspector access to the minimum that is required legally under its uh, NPT safeguards agreement. Um, I, I'm confident that, that were we able to come to some kind of understanding with them on the nuclear side, uh, Iran would uh, reapply the additional protocol uh, which allows for much greater IEA access. Uh, and that greater IEA access would provide much better monitoring of Iranian uh, nuclear activities than we get at the moment. Um, I just want to return for a moment to the, to the issue of legitimacy. I'm, I'm using the word to suggest that there are certain actions that may be defensible legally, um, but that um, strike reasonable people as, as ethically dubious. Now, it may seem that mm, that's neither here nor there, that this is really rather a trivial point. Uh, I, I contend that in the long run, it, it's, not, uh, it's not trivial. Uh, I believe that um, ethical legitimacy is, is crucial um, to Western leadership of the global community. Um, that the absence of legitimacy, the absence of justice, if you like, will in the long run um, breed um, disaffection, um, disaffection and, and resentment, uh, and in an even longer run will uh, possibly breed uh, resentment. It will undermine, in other words, uh, Western leadership of the global community. And in this particular instance, I can see it undermining um, support for the nuclear non-proliferation regime among the numerous non-nuclear weapon states who are very attached uh, to their uh, nuclear rights under the NPT um, and to see that we are trying to uh, impose on Iran a, a derogation uh, from those rights. I think it will undermine support uh, more effectively than allowing Iran to do what it clearly is doing, which is exploit a loophole in the NPT that has existed since 1968, uh, a loophole that allows states to develop uh, certain technologies alleging that they're for peaceful purposes when in fact the likelihood is that what they're seeking is a kind of um, latent, defensive, deterrent nuclear capability. Now, what do I propose? Um, I, I think that there's a lesson to be learnt from a small mistake that the uh, three European foreign ministers made when they went to Tehran in October 2003. Um, the mistake is this. Um, they failed to tie 
suspension explicitly uh, to the provision by the IAEA of assurances that there were no undeclared nuclear activities or material in Iran. Um, this uh, led over time to us coming to believe in the West uh, that suspension uh, was a must-have uh, confidence building measure. Instead of realizing that the real must-have confidence building measure is assurances from the IEA that there are no undeclared uh, nuclear activities or material in Iran. And uh, instead of realizing that suspension is actually um, a confidence building measure whose the value of which is um, declining um, as Iran proceeds, progresses um, towards mastering enrichment technology. Um, applying this lesson uh, means that the core demand now, the core demand that we should be making of Iran is not suspension, um, but that they do whatever's necessary to enable the IEA to provide assurances that there are no undeclared nuclear activities or material in Iran as of 2011. Um, in return for that, because you can be sure the Iranians will want something in return, in return for that we should make a formal commitment that once those assurances are forthcoming and once Iran has reapplied modified Code 3.1 of its subsidiary arrangement, a very technical but important issue, uh, then uh, the Security Council will repeal UN sanctions, I'm not talking about bilateral sanctions, but UN sanctions, and will um, close uh, the Iran nuclear file. That might seem like a big concession. Uh, in fact, it's a, a very logical concession because once the IEA has certified that a state is in full compliance with its MBT obligations, um, there is no justification for Chapter 7 sanctions against that state. What I believe is that once the logjam that has developed over the last six years over the issue of suspension, once that logjam is broken, um, then Iran will be open to discuss a number of confidence-building measures, voluntary confidence-building measures, uh, but useful confidence-building measures. I'm thinking of uh, reapplying and ratif ratifying the uh, IEA additional protocol, which gives this enhanced access, um, committing to limit production of low-enriched uranium to reactor fuel needs, um, uh, committing to ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty uh, on the day following uh, Israeli ratification of the CTBT, uh, committing to apply nuclear export controls in, in accordance with the Nuclear Suppliers Group guidelines, um, negotiating a sub-regional nuclear weapon-free zone, by which I mean a, a nuclear weapon-free zone that covers all the countries that are abut um, on, the, uh, on what we call the Persian Gulf. Um, unfortunately, I, I fear it's going to be many, many years, if not decades, before a, a, a nuclear weapon-free zone covering the whole of the Middle East uh, can, can be negotiated and come into force. Um, and finally, perhaps, um, agreeing to set up with Turkey a bilateral safeguards agency. Uh, this wouldn't replace IEA safeguards, it would complement them. Uh, the model is um, ABAC, a safeguards agency between set up by Argentina and Brazil uh, when those two uh, states decided to abandon their nuclear weapon programs um, and it was set up as a confidence building measure and it's worked very effectively uh, to that end uh, in South America. So at the end of the sort of process I'm outlining, um, I would like to think that the risk of um, uh, confrontation in the Gulf will have been much reduced. Um, the, um, uh, the NPT and the IEA statute uh, will have been upheld. Uh, faith um, will at least have been partially restored in the wisdom and justice of uh, Western leadership of the global community. Um, and uh, an increase in um, oil, uh, global oil, will be in prospect. 
uh, in global oil supply will be in prospect. There is, uh, of course, John mentioned it, there is a possibility that other states in the Middle East will feel uneasy about Iran uh, effectively having a, a latent capability to produce nuclear weapons. But if you actually think about which are the, the, the Middle Eastern states that might be most worried by that, I think it actually only comes down really to one, and that's Saudi Arabia. Um, and we all know that Saudi Arabia enjoys the closest of relations with the United States, uh, and uh, the United States would be very reluctant indeed uh, to see Saudi Arabia embarking on that kind of nuclear program. I don't myself see Turkey having any aspiration uh, to match um, an Iranian latent nuclear weapon capability, uh, and Egypt would have to be very worried about how Israel would react to any uh, Egyptian move in that direction. Um, uh, the other, I'm nearly finished, um, Richard, I'm so sorry. The, the other adv advantage, of course, or the other thing that I would like to hope would result from what I'm advocating is that the nuclear issue will have become disentangled uh, from the very fraught um, and emotional relationship that exists between the United States and, um, and Iran. Uh, and so the risks of uh, emotionally motivated misjudgments uh, leading, uh, to, um, uh, leading to confrontation uh, will, have been, will have been reduced. At the same time, the West will continue to be entirely free to take Iran to task uh, for its abuses of uh, human rights and for any other infringements of international obligations. Finally, I can hear someone ask the question, what happens if in a moment of folly uh, Iran's leaders do decide to produce nuclear weapons? Well, I, I contend that, that the West, having, having reverted, if you like, to playing things by the book, um, the West will be in a much stronger position to rally uh, the global community uh, to um, support uh, whatever action is needed to deter Iran uh, from going down the path of producing nuclear weapons. Uh, I think there's a world of difference between invoking Chapter 7 of the Security Council to interdict a clear breach of Article 2 of the NPT, a vital article, uh, and invoking the uh, Chapter 7 to try and impose on Iran, against its will, a derogation of its NPT rights. Thank you, and I'm sorry if I've overrun. Thank you.